Thank you everyone for coming. I'll just start by introducing myself. My name is Chelsea Rowell. I'm the Digital Initiatives Librarian at Wake Forest University. Um, in that capacity, I oversee digitization of special collections, and then I also liaise with faculty who are interested in pursuing digital humanities and research. So with that combination of responsibilities, you can understand why participating in the DPLA would be so attractive, not only to our institution, but also to me personally, because it helps me to market our digitized special collections as potential corpora for digital humanities research. So fairly early in the process of envisioning the DPLA, Dan Cohen used the metaphor of a pond feeding a lake, feeding an ocean, to characterize the planned technical infrastructure. He wrote in a blog post, one can think of the initial set of materials as content from local ponds, small libraries, archives, museums, and historic sites sent through streams to lakes, state digital libraries, and then through rivers to oceans, the DPLA. And not to extend the metaphor too far, but it certainly influenced Wake Forest's understanding of our niche within a larger ecology. I'm shamelessly using the ponds, lakes, ocean metaphor to structure my presentation. And I'll spend a little bit of time on the ocean and the lake, but for the most part, I'll concentrate on Wake Forest's perspective as a pond or a contributing institution. The DPLA markets itself um, via its tripartite mission to be a portal, which is the DPLA site, a platform, which is the DPLA API, and then a strong public option. So for me, it's really the second item in that tripartite mission, the portal, which is most resonant. And um, I actually, just in my history of following the DPLA, I connect it very strongly with Ed Summers, who wrote a blog post that called attention to the phrase, the generative platform for unspecified future uses in his description of, of, about what the DPLA could be. So by working with the grain of the web and deeply linking between content and from content to contributing institutions, the DPLA facilitates or can facilitate deep research and knowledge creation. But aside this very serious purpose, one of the primary use qualities of the DPLA, whether it's browsing the DPLA site or interacting with one of the apps that's built on top of the API, is just fun. It's really fun. And I think that this doodle, <laughs> which was uh, captured during one of the early DPLA plenaries, sort of conveys that sense of fun. So we at Wake Forest want to expose our materials to the world, and we want to do it in a way that aligns with the web and with this concept of a generative platform on top of which people can build things. So moving backwards from the ocean of the DPLA through the rivers to the lake or the service hub, um, I got some information from Nick Graham and Lisa Gregory, who lead the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center. So I'll speak briefly to their role as a DPLA service hub, just in order to contextualize Wake Forest participation as a contributing institution. And Chelsea, can I throw in here? So uh, I'm Chris Freeland. I'm an associate university librarian at Washington University. And I'm going to be speaking more on the lake piece, on how here locally in Missouri we're building a, a DPLA response. So the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center is an ongoing LSTA-funded program that provides digitization and digital publishing services to cultural heritage institutions across the state of North Carolina. Typically, when an institution partners with the Digital Heritage Center to digitize their, mater their materials, those materials are also published on the Digital Heritage Center's site, digitalnc.org, pictured here. 
Because of the Digital Heritage Center's strong existing relationships with academic libraries, public libraries, archives, museums, historical societies, and others in North Carolina, it was really a natural fit to act as a DPLA service hub. In, in fall 2013, they formally became a service hub, part of the, I guess, the second cohort of service hubs following the DPA's, DPLA's launch in April 2013. And what that meant for us locally was that in October, the Digital Heritage Center invited digital collections managers from across the state to a day-long informational meeting in Greensboro. Emily Gore and Amy Rudersdorf from the DPLA were there, and so the point was for us to talk with one another, to learn more about the DPLA metadata model, their ingest process, and ask any questions that might be particular to the peculiarities of our digital collections. We at Wake Forest and really all of these institutions are in, in North Carolina are really lucky because the relationship infrastructure is already in place. I think a lot of times we think that the technical infrastructure is going to be the hard part, but that groundwork has primarily been laid and more sometimes we find that it's the relationship infrastructure that's the hard part and as it happens, um, it's already strongly established in North Carolina. So institutions can contribute to the DPLA via the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center Service Hub in one of two ways. The, the first way is simply for the materials to appear in digitalnc.org. So this map pictures the locations of institutional partners with the Digital Heritage Center, and it, it's reflective. Those, those institutions, their materials also appear in digitalnc.org. As we say in North Carolina, you can see that they stretch from the mountains to the sea. And then also the Digital Heritage Center's partners run the gamut of types of institutions from, from academic libraries, 68 academic libraries, 52 public libraries or private libraries and archives, and 24 cultural heritage organizations such as museums or historical societies. The second way that institutions can contribute to the DPLA via the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center is to actually contribute OAI feeds of their own digital collections that appear on, on their site. And so currently there are 12 institutions contributing to the DPLA this way, including the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center itself, the State Library and State Archives of North Carolina, eight academic libraries, and two public libraries. Of these, most institutions are using Content DM, and as it happens, Wake Forest is the only institution using DSpace to manage our digital special collections. So to a certain degree, we've just had to blindly feel our way forward, and we're proud of the steps we've made so far. So I'm going to very briefly summarize the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center's ingest process, but you should know that this is all just a summary of what Lisa Gregory from the Digital Heritage Center shared with me, and if you have any questions, rather than field them myself, I would be happy to put you in contact with her. Each month, the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center provides the DPLA with a single stream of metadata represented in MODS, they form this single stream of metadata by aggregating the feeds that are provided by various other institutions, such as New Hanover Public Library or Wake Forest. So to incorporate an institution to, into this single stream, what the Digital Heritage Center asks for is that institution's OAI PMH URL. They take a look at their metadata and make sure that all the elements that the DPLA requires are present. Um, then they create an XSLT style sheet per institution that transforms Dublin Core elements to MODS elements. Once the style sheet is prepared, they use Repox to, which is a, um, Repox is a, an aggregation software, so they use Repox to combine all of these feeds for each um, institution providing a feed to indicate which collections that they want to be included into that feed and to assign the style sheet for that institution. 
Then they do a test ingest. They look at the mod's output to make sure that it's not wonky. At that point, they're pretty much set, and they contribute that single mod stream to the DPLA. Each month, about a week before the DPLA harvests or is scheduled to harvest from the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, they will re-ingest all of the different institutions' feeds in order to incorporate any changes to metadata or any new collections that an institution is requesting be added. Um, at that point, they simply wait until the DPLA finishes harvesting. They might do some spot checking to see how materials appear in the DPLA and if there are um, unexpected outcomes, then they will sort of mediate that process of submitting a ticket. So that's the Digital Heritage Center's ingest process and part of their role of sort of mediating between contributing institutions and the DPLA as a whole. As far as the benefits for the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center of per participating in the DPLA, they reported that they get about 100 to 200 visits per month and 300 page views per month directly from the DPLA. Um, and of course, the DPLA is always looking for ways to increase traffic to partner websites by promoting content through blogs and Twitter and other social media. But when I spoke with Lisa Gregory of the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center by email, she said, quote, the bigger benefits we've seen so far from participation is the experience we've gained in aggregating metadata on such a broad scale and seeing how it performs, as well as being a player in the conversation about data aggregation with others in the DPLA. And I think, um, I'll talk more about this later, but I think Wake Forest really shares that perspective that driving traffic to our collections is one thing, but there are other benefits in addition to traffic that we derive from our participation in the DPLA. Having shared my understanding of the larger DPLA ecosystem in which Wake Forest is participating, now I'll, I'll focus on our experience so far as a contributing institution. From the beginning, our TAC was purposefully iterative and incremental. Like many institutions, there are imperfections hidden in our digital collections, and rather than trying to correct everything all at once, we tried to break things down into smaller chunks that we could achieve each month. And we felt that this approach really fits in well with the DPLA's design process, which also drew inspiration from agile development methodologies. Memorably for me was the, um, the DPLA beta sprint that garnered submissions that thoughtfully engaged all sorts of design problems from aggregating metadata to preserving an item's context in its original collection and designing interfaces that facilitate serendipitous discovery. So. For us, um, agile, agile development is really a loose, a very loose framework for how we approached contributing to the DPLA. It wasn't necessarily a, se a series of strictly defined four-week sprints, but what was valuable for us was defining a single priority that we wanted to focus on at the expense of all the other possible priorities that we could focus on during, during a so-called development cycle. So, for the rest of the time, I'm going to address our series of problems and sort of discuss how we broke them down into smaller priorities. First, though, a little bit of context. WakeSpace is where all of our Wake Forest University digital collections live. WakeSpace is an instance of DSpace, and it's the home not only of our digital special collections, but also of our institutional repository and also digital content related to campus events like symposia, recordings of the library lecture series, things like that. So to a certain extent, because of all of our digital content kind of lives in the same DSpace bucket, we are first challenge was sort of wrapping our, our heads around how we would contribute 
selected collections. And those collections were either selected because, well, we weren't contributing our IR content, but also even within our, our digital special collections, there were some that we really did want to invest more time in, in cleaning up, and so we didn't quite want to contribute them to the DPLA yet. And so this was certainly my first experience in con exposing collections via OAI and sort of really engaging in that standard. So when I was framing this problem, I was first thinking like, oh, well, it should be like bundling an RSS feed. We should be able to bundle these OAI PMH, PMH feeds for specific collections and then send that bundle to the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center. In the end, it really turned out to be a non-problem because through Repox, they were just able to identify us as a data provider and then identify the sets that we wish to provide. But it was the first, um, the first challenge that we really tried to engage with. The, the second challenge was revising our rights statement. So when we first began planning on contributing our collections to the DPLA, our rights statement didn't exist at the item level. And really, it existed more at the collection level. And so we knew that if we were contributing our collections to the DPLA and our items were going to appear in that context, we certainly wanted to include our rights statement at the item level. But it also, if we were going to have to populate the rights statement at the item level, it was also really an opportunity to revisit what our rights statement was and and make sure that we weren't falsely communicating a sense of ownership of these materials, but, you know, trying to be more explicit about the fuzzy status of, of many special collections. So it really created an opportunity for me to bring together our scholarly communication librarian and also representatives from special collections faculty and they worked together and we went through a couple of drafts and, and got a right statement that everyone was happy with. So <coughs> before participating in our first harvest and building on our revised right statement, the two things that we identified as um, changes that we did want to make before our digital, for, changes we did want to make to our digital collections before contributing was a, populating DC rights, and B, populating DC type. So there were lots of other things that we might also want to have revised within our metadata, things like making sure that all of our items had a date created so that they could appear in the DPLA timeline, making sure that all of our things had spatial information so that they would appear in the DPLA map, but both of those would take more time. And so at just the base level, we wanted to make sure we had rights and type, and those were super easy, and we did populate those fields, and then we participated in our first harvest. Oh, right, so here's the value of making sure that DC type was populated. Um, it means that users in the DPLA environment could, for example, select text and make sure that they were viewing items that were textual as opposed to items that were images. Our second big challenge was making sure that our thumbnails appeared in the DPLA for Working with the Digital Heritage Center, this was a little bit of a unique challenge for Wake Forest as opposed to other North Carolina collections who um, either sort of all of their thumbnails appeared in one space on the server where their digital collections were hosted or there was a predictable naming pattern. Because we're a DSpace institution, our, the URLs of our thumbnails, just like the URLs of our metadata records or digital objects are opaque identifiers and um, also if we're contributing our collections via OAI, the Dublin Core OAI feed, the location of the thumbnail isn't included in that descriptive metadata record. In short, and if you have more detailed questions, I can talk about it later, but essentially what we did was 
treat the locations of the thumbnails as identifiers in the Dublin Core record, and there was a handy-dandy attribute that we could turn on to indicate those URLs as thumbnails. And our thumbnails do not have not yet appeared in the DPLA. The last harvest, we did make this change, but that happened to coincide with Code for Lib. <laughs> so we have an, an open ticket, and we hope that by the end of the month, we will have our thumbnails appearing in DPLA. So the, the current challenge that we're grappling with at the moment is that we would really like to move from contributing a Dublin Core OAI feed to either a MODS or a METS OAI feed. Um, that sort of gives us the control of mapping the qualified Dublin Core elements to MODS elements rather than relying on the Digital Heritage Center to do it. And um, this is definitely the area, I would say, where we're feeling our way forward the most blindly. So if you have any feedback about this process, we would, we would welcome it. I think another really tangible benefit of mapping to mods ourselves is that for collaborative digitization projects in which we've participated in the past, such, such as this project called Digital Forsyth, which um, had contributors from different libraries in Forsyth County in Winston-Salem where Wake Forest is located. So we host digital Forsyth materials in Wake Space at Wake Forest University. But when we contribute those materials, which are fabulous, we want the contributing institution not to be Wake Forest University, but rather to be Forsyth County Public Library or Winston-Salem State University. And it's certainly possible for the Digital Heritage Center to sort of hard code that into their XSLT style sheets, but we would rather uh, build our mods infrastructure so that we are pushing that out and exposing that information via OAI ourselves. So that's the, the current task or I guess development cycle in which we see ourselves. Future development cycles really the possibilities are endless. I mentioned that we certainly would want to make sure that we have date created for all of our items. We would certainly hope to have spatial information for all of our items so that they would appear in the timeline and the map on the DPLA site. Um, subject, subject, you know, su applying subject terms to all of our items is something that we would be interested in doing. But I guess Viewing our participation as this ongoing iterative thing meant that we didn't have to do all of those things all at once, but it also helped to define our participation in the DPLA as an ongoing digital project, just like all of our other digitization streams, so that we could devote a certain amount of time every month to going back and cleaning up our existing collections, as well as moving forward with new collections. So a few takeaways at the very end. We see our participation in the DPLA as offering us increased traffic, certainly. Um, but really, more importantly, it's an opportunity to continually evaluate and improve our metadata. For me, in my liaison role, it's also, it also offers us the ability to market our digital collections as data and possibly the ability to engage our public in new ways. At Wake Forest, we have a humanities institute, and under the auspices of the humanities institute, there's a digital humanities initiative. We meet regularly, and I pitched the idea of a DPLA API workshop to that group, and it was received enthusiastically. So I can imagine events like this taking place in the fall or the coming spring, and those sorts of events are certainly not things that we could have facilitated ourselves had we not participated in the DPLA. Um, so I think we have time for maybe one or two questions before we move on to Chris's presentation. Just 
terms of a, a daisy chain approach of Wake Forest to the mm -hmm. North Carolina Cultural Heritage Site, the, the statewide aggregator, and then to the PLA, um, if you need to take something down, how quickly can that process flow through? That was something that we talked about at the beginning. It was one reason we wanted to include the right statement within the right statement is a, you know, contact us if you have questions or sort of a, an avenue for people to say, I don't think you have the rights to this and I don't think you should be displaying it. So because it hasn't taken place yet that we've gotten a takedown request, I can't speak exactly to what the time frame would be, but at at the longest, it would be until the next har the next monthly harvest takes place. But I imagine if we felt that it was urgent, we could probably submit a ticket to the DPLA via the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center, and it could probably be sped up. Other questions? A re uh, applause. <laughs> <Kelsey>. <laughs> So I'm going to talk. My name is Chris Freeland. I'm an associate university librarian here at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, the middle piece, the, the building the lake. Uh, Chelsea uh, says that, uh, that the relationship infrastructure is the hard part. Yes, in fact, it is. And that's what I'm going to talk about today is the challenges that we face here locally, the challenges and opportunities that we face locally here in responding to DPLA at, in the state of Missouri. Um, Missouri has a similar infrastructure to North Carolina, but we're at a different state of development and a, a, a different state of, of having the conversation. So uh, that's what I want to walk through today and also a belated welcome to uh, the fair city of St. Louis. I hope, <laughs> hope you all are enjoying your time. I'm going to talk about these three topics, uh, my history with DPLA, the local organizing efforts here in Missouri, and then sort of uh, bring it all together in the status and next steps. So. I started with DPLA in uh, 2011. This is a, 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 a panel that I participated in at Harvard uh, talking about what could the DPLA be. This was before the name DPLA was settled upon. Uh, this was a what could this thing be, this digital public library of America. I think the, the, the P public part was inserted in uh, around these conversations. So I gave a talk. I was the technical director of the Biodiversity Heritage Library at the time, and I uh, was asked to give a talk about open access and open data and what it means to work in an open environment, and uh, that's what I love to do. So um, I, I gave a, uh, this plea, made this plea for keeping data and the infrastructure of DPLA as open as possible, and that we should not put any new gatekeepers in place, that, the, that these are open data, they should be left as open data. And that if we were looking at a, a, a way forward with DPLA, let's look at the material that has already been digitized, that's already mobilized, let's pull that together. And so I was making this point of digitizing public domain books is non-controversial, let's go with that. And there was a lot of applause and the, a fist pump and a, and a lot of applause in the room. Um, I think maybe because of that fist pump, then uh, I was asked to participate in a technical summit that was held in June later of that year. Uh, this was part of the early work stream discussions with DPLA. Uh, this again was before the DPLA website had launched. And this really was these formative discussions of what could it be, how big would this, like what could it what could we do with DPLA? And we had some, some really, this was a really good discussion. It was a one day session um, at Library of Congress. And I think the, the most important one was, are the third and fourth points, that there was less emphasis on the front door and, uh, and more on the services and the entry points. That really the power of DPLA was in aggregating these resources and pulling them together under a, a coherent and consistent interface. And, being able to build APIs on top of that data so that other people could use the data in the way that they wanted to. Uh, on one of Chelsea's slides, there was a thing, there was a, a little diamond that said the shiny thing. We started talking about the DPLA, the UI was not the shiny thing. The shiny thing was the, were the API and the, and the data beneath. So that was a fun discussion. Um, and I, and uh, I, I would say that this, again, was very early and maybe helped shape the direction of, of things to come with DPLA. I also participated in one of the early hackathons. This is on your left is uh, my view. I was here in St. Louis. The hackathon happened in Cambridge. So my view from Skype and then the resulting big brother uh, bringing me into the room in Cambridge. I will say this, that uh, participating in a hackathon remotely can be challenging, but it was also a lot of fun. Um, 
Uh, so I think this was the first hackathon organized under the banner or the auspice of, of DPLA. So all of this to say that I was part of the early discussions and was uh, watched very happily as DPLA found funding, organized, hired staff, and became the product, the, the platform that it is today. And it became this really important, tangible thing. And that's what brings me here to talk with you today is that the we, we here in Missouri see this as a thing that we want to participate in. We want to make our data available in DPLA. So a little bit about the state of the state of Missouri. And this is not a... a uh, warts and all kind of conversation. There's no dirty laundry to be aired here. Um, in early 2000, we had a statewide digitization model similar to the ones in Colorado and elsewhere, and it funded a project called Virtually Missouri. Virtually Missouri was both a platform as well as a series of digitization conferences and networking. That platform has moved on its own migration path and is now Missouri Digital Heritage, which is sponsored by the State Library and the State Archives. Oh, I broke the chair, sorry. <laughs> the conferences and networking became local. So when the statewide efforts uh, pulled back a bit, we said, well, let's keep having these conversations. These are really valuable and important to have. And they became these casual books and beer kinds of conversations where let's just get together, let's, let's have a conversation about what we might be able to do together. And I think the important thing to think here is that we focus locally because it's easy for us to get, you know, 30, we were all 30 minutes away from one another so we could get in a room, we could get in our cars and, um, and have a face-to-face -face conversation without a lot of organization. So picking up on, on these themes, we decided to do the social engineering from these existing networks. And we, I was working at MBG, uh, Missouri Botanical Garden at the time and realized that there was a need for bringing technical people together locally. Um, and we created this group called TECO, Technology Exchange for Cultural Heritage Organizations in St. Louis, which we thought was terribly clever, this wonderful acronym that I now have to explain every time we talk about what TECO is. Um, it is what it is. You know, who cares what it is? The important thing is that it brought people together. The, the fact was, we said, yeah, we, we want to work together. We want to collaborate. And this is cultural heritage organizations and beyond, not just libraries and museums, but also universities and uh, technology partners, even financial institutions. So we have a, a it, it's a research library at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. But they wanted to be part of the conversation. They want to get their content into DPLA. They don't see themselves necessarily as a cultural heritage organization, yet they have uh, uh, economic data that helps describe the history of St. Louis, the history of the United States, incredibly important information that should be in a digital public library of America. So we think of this in the same way that the Missouri Digital Heritage does, which is all of this content is about Missouri and it should all be made available. We also saw this as an opportunity to share experience and collaborate the, around uh, emerging topics like linked data and digital platforms and digital exhibitions, maybe even going so far as to say, maybe in our partner institutions locally here in St. Louis, we all don't need to run Fedora repositories, or we could look at maybe digital preservation at scale locally rather than each of us having to go it alone. It all came together then in a meeting that was just six and a half months ago, uh, September of last year. We uh, we met at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis and we, we asked, what can we do with DPLA? How can we organize and how can we get our content into DPLA? And the number one question was, well, who can be the service hub in Missouri? And the Missouri Digital Heritage, uh, uh, the partners were there and they participated in the meeting in full. And they said, Con uh, the Missouri Digital Heritage is content DM. It's in migration. If we want to do anything quickly, we can't mobilize Missouri Digital Heritage. So we said, okay, that's great. We understand where, where the state is and let's talk about how we can continue moving forward and keep everyone in the loop. They were very happy with that. They, they were very happy to be participating alongside this effort. Uh, an important thing about timing, we, uh, one of the reasons, one of the conversations was, well, let's, let's move quickly. And the question was, well, why so quickly? In, 
St. Louis this year in 2014 is our 250th anniversary of the formation of the city. It's our 250th birthday. A Jeopardy note, that's the Sester Centennial. So if that ever comes <laughs> up in, uh, in Jeopardy. Um, and, and also the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis was celebrating its centennial, its 100th anniversary. Uh, so both of these things came together and we said 2014 is it. This is when we want to get our content into DPLA. An interesting point that came up during the conversations was uh, came from our one of our uh, humanists, one of our uh, digital humanities workshop uh, folks. They they said, "What questions can't be asked about Missouri in DPLA today?" And if you go to DPLA, you'll find there is information about Missouri, but it doesn't tell the story. There isn't an exhibition. There isn't all of these sort of formative materials. It's a somewhat um, serendipitous accumulation of materials that have been held in other people's repositories. It's not Missouri repositories again because we don't yet have that infrastructure. So. Where there are gaps in, in the Missouri story in DPLA. We understood that there were lessons to be learned from other hubs, that we didn't have to go it alone. Um, and we also wondered, maybe even most importantly, what else could our libraries do together in addition to DPLA? We all recognized that DPLA was important and we wanted to look at it as a goalpost, but maybe there are other things that we could be doing and formalizing and organizing as well. One of the, one of the best conversations was about the scope of content. And we got in, we had this really good conversation of what's the Missouriness of a, of a digital object. And I think this is an interesting, uh, an interesting point. So you can look at this image. It may be a little hard to see with the, with the overhead lights, but this is the gateway arch. It's a relatively identifiable object about Missouri. Not a whole lot of questions. This is a Missouri object. A couple of small points. Um, Keen observers will realize that this is not a photograph of today's downtown. This photograph was from 1966. I think it's a beautiful photograph of uh, uh, shortly after the early opening of the of the arch. A second point, this photograph was taken in Illinois. That's the, the river <laughs> looking at Missouri. So if we were going to post this to our Facebook wall or Flickr, the geotags are going to show this as an Illinois object, not a Missouri object. So it is what it is. But then you take something like this. So this is a piece of the papyri collection at Washington University Library. Is this a Missouri object? It's in Missouri. It's from our collections. Um, should this go into DPLA? And again, we went with the same, had the same conversations that the Missouri Digital Heritage, uh, same guiding principles, which was, yes, this is a Missouri object. There's a story to be told as to why that object is in our collections. There's an interesting part of the history of science, the history of, of Missouri, the, the role of St. Louis in the history of Missouri and the history of the United States as to why these unusual assemblage of objects are here in St. Louis. There's a great story to be told about that. So we said, yes, in fact, this is a Missouri object. So with those kinds of really, uh, you know, discussions thrashed about, uh, we said, okay, let's, let's do this. So here's where we are, the progress. We have a, a loosely coupled administrative working group uh, formed by people from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, the Missouri History Museum, and Washington University. We have a technical group who uh, is led, that, that is led by David Henry at the Missouri History Museum, who deserves a special shout out because he's really just a superstar and is pulling all of this together and working with Emily Gore, uh, Amy Rudersdorf, and the folks at DPLA on making this connection between Missouri and, and DPLA. We have participation and support from the Missouri Digital Heritage, which we thought was absolutely critical for us to, to be able to really go forward in full. And we sent out a message just at the end of February to universities, public libraries, and consortia saying that we were building this and who's with us. And we've gotten a really good response back from that. <coughs> so the goal by October is to have our content in DPLA through a Missouri-centered hub 214 days away from today. <laughs> if you can hear the clock ticking, I can as well. Um, we're going to do it. I'm, I'm confident that we can do this, and here's why. We're taking a startup approach. We're doing, uh, doing more and talking less. Uh, we're thinking uh, fast and flexible. I'm not going to try to throw out all the buzzwords that we had there at those early discussions, but really it was how can we make this happen in a quick amount of time? The number one way was that we have a gang of the willing. Everyone who's participating in this conversation wants to see their content in DPLA. There's, we are having every discussion to say, how can we make this happen? We have as little or as much legal as needed at the right time. Um, so we are a loosely formed non-organization at this time. We don't have an MOU yet, but we are developing one. We know that, that, that we have to have an MOU, that we have to have more sustainability and organization around this loose coupling that we have. 
And our guiding principle, again, at this point has been towards innovation. Let's innovate and organize and then formalize. It's been easier for us to talk, to, to show something than to talk about it. In terms of the technical engineering, this is also one of the reasons why we, we were pretty confident we could hit this uh, pretty fast timeline, because it's a similar technology profile to what uh, Chelsea was describing at Wake Forest. It's Repox and OAI. And we're using that same technology stack because that's what DPLA is, um, is advertising and is helping people build. So we're, again, we're not having to go that alone. We're not having to build much in terms of scra from scratch. We're having to make sure that like Chelsea was describing, our metadata fit and that we have the right on-ramps, but we don't have to build this all from scratch. There are these pieces that we can take and reuse, which moves us forward pretty rapidly. There, are some also, there were some specifics that we decided upon that also helped in this determining the path of least resistance. We agreed right from the start, from day one, that the aggregator, the state-based art aggregator, will be a silent utility without any kind of a user interface. So it's not as though someone's going to be able to go to, like, the, uh, the North Carolina Digital Heritage Center. There is not going to be a corresponding user interface, anything.org, for this service today. It's just going to be the silent utility that's running, getting the information from the repositories and putting it into DPLA. We, we thought that if we tried to build a UI that that would start stepping on some political toes around Missouri Digital Heritage. That's not really our goal. Our goal is to get content into DPLA, let DPLA be the user interface to these data. Another, a second point was that really to fast track this, we had to use OAI as the minimum entry today. Again, this is a, dis a decision and discussion for getting us, getting our content in by October. And we understand that, that, that Obviously, that there will be um, some collections that may not be OAI enabled that we'll have to build on ramps, and that's to come. That 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 will happen over time, and and we think that that's probably uh, largely the role of the Missouri Digital Heritage is to keep content coming in. We see ourselves as that aggregator and that utility and the the engine uh, that that helps move content into DPLA. But the but it's going to originate from other organizations and and should be done in concert with the Missouri Digital Heritage. So where we are today, we are in construction phase. We're uh, demonstrating, like uh, having this conversation today um, and talking with other people in the state and region about what could we do together as uh, with DPLA. So though I said we uh, uh, do more and talk less, we're still doing a fair amount of talking. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. So in terms of our next steps, I had to include this, this image, which I just find is utterly charming. It's from 1925. This is a Charleston uh, dance contest on the, on the steps of St. Louis City Hall. I just love this image. I don't know why I, resp I respond to it so well, but I just think it's, it, it's just great. Um, so where we are, content into DPLA by October, fingers crossed. Um, as we get uh, more content in, adding more members, and then having the conversations already happening about sustainability. We did not go into this thinking, oh, we're, you know, this will just run itself. We know there has to be sustainability. We're talking about that now, but we're not getting it, we're not being bogged down by it currently. Um, I think it's this sort of fast and flexible approach. And another thing about sustainability is that we're mitigating any of these, many of these risks by having a really small footprint. You know, to be able to run this, the Repox service, it, takes like the smallest corner of a server. It's not like as though it's a, a big onerous task for anyone to run. We could move this into any other organization. Any of the Missouri organizations have said, sure, once it's built, we can run this uh, uh, going forward. So, uh, so that's good. What I want to leave you with, what I hope you, you take away from, uh, from my conversation here is that in Missouri, we have assembled. The group is together. Uh, we, we brought the band back together. We're getting our content ready for uh, DPLA, and we're uh, looking towards October of, of having that launch. We've gotten the buy-in from the major stakeholders, and we've started building the low-barrier tech utilities that will make all of this happen. We look, our group looks at DPLA as a catalyst. It turned our conversations into action. It gave us the thing that we wanted to point at and say, yes, this is what, no, we shouldn't just be having this conversation about doing something together. Let's do it and let's, let's put our attention towards getting content into DPLA. It's been great to have, that, to have that goal in mind. 
We also see DPLA as a wholly collaborative environment. So I, I mentioned several times, we don't feel like we're going it alone. We're not having to totally uh, build this all from scratch. And in fact, the way that Chelsea and I were brought together for this talk, we both, we individually submitted uh, uh, our local perspective from DPLA and the CNI organizers said, why don't you combine this into a single session? And we said, of course, that makes perfect sense. That's the way the DPLA operates. So everything that, that I have done with DPLA has, uh, has demonstrated and shown that it really is this just amazing, incredible, amazingly incredible collaborative environment. Um, given this experience, I, I say I come back to, uh, to thinking that casual networks can be some of the most effective. Uh, the, this group here and the conversations that you're all having in the hallways are probably more as effective as some of the structured conversations you're having uh, back home. I'm seeing lots of nods, uh, nodding heads throughout the room. So yeah, th this is the reason why we come to these things, is to have these conversations and to, um, to build these kinds of networks. Uh, a couple of final points. Uh, one, you know, we said, what else can we do besides DPLA? And we really are thinking about the future. So we, we fully embraced DPLA. And we see it as an important repository, but we've also then been having conversations, well, now that we have this group of people together, what, could, what else do our collections have in common? Could we be going, to, uh, going for NEH grants? Could we be looking for big data uh, projects? Is there more here that we could, uh, that we could pull together? Which is exciting. It's, it's great to be thinking about the future of our organizations and how we could be working together, again, in this local um, statewide environment. And finally, uh, I, I don't want to end on a, on a down note, but instead a reminder of why we're doing this. None of the images that you've seen today are available in the Digital Public Library of America. We don't have that on-ramp to get content from Missouri into DPLA. That's the reason why we're doing all of the work we're doing, so that someone could go to, to, D, to DPLA and hear this story about Missouri or find these images. So that's where we are. See you in October. <laughs> And please enjoy the rest of your stay in uh, the city of St. Louis. Thank you very much.